So we are under recording now. So at this point, fellas, why don't you go ahead and share your screen with us, Mark and Andy. Very good, we're gonna have a little pause and I'm going to introduce you. Well, welcome to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition. Our topic is the ocular manifestations of diabetes mellitus with Drs. Andrew Gerwood and Dr. Mark Myers. Dr. Andrew Gerwood is a professor of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry at Salish University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He is attending staff at the Department of Ophthalmology at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia. Dr. Myers is a senior staff optometrist at the Coatesville VA Medical Center in Coatesville, PA. He's also a guest lecturer and adjunct clinical faculty at Pennsylvania College of Optometry. Both Drs. Gerwin and Myers contribute numerous publications and lectures throughout North America on the topic of ocular disease. Now, I want to say that it's been my, my privilege and pleasure to have known these practitioners, these doctors, these professionals for virtually my entire career. Uh, Andy and I were in, in class together. We were in residency together. He is one of my closest, uh, he's, he's a family member to me, and he introduced us to Mark. He brought Mark in, mentored him, and they have become two of the top minds and educators in optometry who have worked tirelessly uh, to advance our profession and enhance the learning of our colleagues. So with that, let's give a nice virtual round of applause to our speakers, Andy and Mark on diabetes. Guys, take it away. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. That's really sweet. Very nice. I consider you family as well. Hi, folks. Uh, we're not going to try to be clever or heady. We're not going to try to be talking heads. We're going to try to give you information you can use tomorrow. And so uh, there'll be some things that build the base of the pyramid so it doesn't fall down, so you don't have to memorize things, so it all makes sense rationally to you. But otherwise, hopefully we're going to tell you stuff, mostly review, I think, that's going to help you practice tomorrow. All you have to do is put a question in the chat box, and Joe will probably help us to know what questions are in there, and we'll answer them as we go. You're the most important person in the room to us. Can you make it go? Should go. Okay, so why is that not advancing? Okay, so let's do this. Okay. Okay, that's our disclaimer slide. We don't have any skin in the game, although I wish we did. This is a glucose molecule. Um, have any of you ever gone to the coin laundry? If you've gone to the coin laundry, you probably went there with a dollar bill. And of course the coin laundry machine didn't take dollar bills, at least not back in the old days. Maybe today it takes tens, twenties, fives, the whole thing. But back in my day, and I guess that was the time of Lincoln. It's hard to be funny over the internet. Uh, you had to actually take your dollar bill, make change, get quarters, then put quarters in those slots and then push the quarters in to make it go. Glucose is quarters. When you eat, you eat dollar bills. You eat tens and twenties and you chew it up, you masticate, you swallow, it goes down into your stomach and all the food is broken down into smaller components. The component that can get into your cells to make you do this is glucose. Glucose runs the whole show. Glucose is the body's gasoline. And so the way that things get into your body is this remarkable molecule called insulin. And insulin is created and produced by the longer Han cells in the pancreas. And so here's your pancreas, as you can see it right here. Joe, when I point, is it coming through? It is. Excellent. So you can see your pancreas is right in the middle of your organs. This is a pancreatic cell. The beta, the beta, the beta liner runs right in here, and they produce insulin, and that insulin molecule allows glucose entry into the cells. And so you can see if you're missing glucose, or the glucose is broken, or the glucose is misunderstood, or it's in short repair, you're going to have problems with sugar metabolism. And if you can't get glucose into the cells, then you can't do this. And if you can't do this, you can't drink your morning coffee. And so insulin is the molecule that we need. And the other molecule is glucagon. Glucagon is stimulated by the pancreas whenever you need to mobilize stored 
uh, glycogen. You don't use all the glucose that you have in your body every single time you eat. And so you store some of it in the liver and in the fat cells. And when you need it and you don't have food, then you have to go get it. And so you get it by liberating glucagon. And it's a very sort of elegant uh, pathway. Here you can see your blood sugar is high. You just had a meal. It promotes the pancreas to secrete insulin. The insulin then puts it all into the tissues. And so your blood sugar lowers. Whatever is left is stored as glycogen in the liver and your blood sugar lowers. Now you have low blood sugar and for whatever reason, you have to go shopping at the mall or whatever, but you haven't eaten. And so it tells your pancreas through hormones and regulatory events that occur in the brain to liberate glucagon. Glucagon converts glycogen into glucose, which raises the blood sugar and the whole thing starts over again. If you're out of glycogen stores or anything else like that happens, then you'll get feeling in your brain to be hungry. And so those sorts of things help regulate your glucose on a constant level. And so diabetes in its fairest and most obvious thing is broken glucose metabolism. And as I mentioned, there are four reasons. One, for one reason or another, you don't have any insulin. Now people are born with pancreases that don't work for, only work for a short period of time and then they give up, they don't produce insulin or they never produced insulin. So you were born with a, a defective pancreas. Some people though, most people, almost all people are born with a pancreas that works properly, but it gives up over time. And so uh, when it gives up over time, you become what's known as a non-insulin dependent diabetic. And so these people are insulin dependent diabetics and these people are non-insulin dependent diabetics. And so another thing is also possible. And that's when your insulin is present, but it's broken. And if it's broken, then it doesn't do the job it was intended to do as well as it should, and you wind up with difficulties. And finally, it's possible that maybe the receiver is broken, and so broken receptors. And these things can happen over time as a result of age-related atrophy. It's the same reason that Michael Jordan, possibly the greatest basketball player of all time, can no longer dunk a basketball, even though he remains six foot six or thereabouts. I know you shrink as you get older, but he, he's certainly not under six feet, but he can't get to the rim because of age-related atrophy. And all these things seem to contribute to the last three on the menu. There's another thing that happens when you wind up becoming diabetic, and that's called this polyol pathway. Knowing this isn't gonna make you a better eye doctor. However, it's important to understand that you do go through this other facet of dealing with hyperglycemia, and that's taking glucose molecules and attaching them onto proteins. Now imagine this guy can get through a door that is exactly his shape, but I stick a glucose molecule on here like this. That's called non-enzymatic glycosylation, or glycation as you see at the bottom of the screen. Now his structure is altered and his function is altered and anything he comes in contact with that's associated with this molecule won't work properly. In this regard, you get alternate pathways and you get alternate physiology. The biggest of which is the promotion of sugar alcohol. Sugar alcohol happens because in, in diabetes, you wind up with glucose that you can't manage. So you wind up with sustained hyperglycemia. For whatever reason in your body, you have a lot of aldose reductase, which means you convert a lot of this glucose to sugar alcohol. And this is just one example of sugar alcohol. Sugar alcohol is osmotically active, it pulls water. That means now you wind up with water in places where it doesn't go. And it's also poison. It kills vital cells that are responsible for natural physiology in your body. So you wind up with a decreasing physiology, an excess amount of water, and these problems that are occurring because of osmotic pressure and osmotic movement. Now you can convert sorbitol to simple sugar that you can use. There are what are called dehydrogenase molecules that do that. However, you don't have a lot of those. And so as a natural 
uh, occurrence in diabetes, when you have sustained hyperglycemia, you get lots of sugar alcohol, lots of non-enzymatic glycosylation, and poor conversion to simple sugar. And all of these things leads to uh, defects in function and structure, which causes all of the different problems that you wind up with as a consequence of the sustained hyperglycemia produced by diabetes, the four things we talked about that give you high glucose in your system. One of which are these diabetic snowflake cataracts. Here you can see that sugar alcohol has caused water and water movement in the lens fracturing the natural crystal clear opacity and architecture of the lens producing these snowflake opacities. By the way, just so you know, this is an antique slide. It's a stereo slide. And if you do this thing where you put your finger here, sort of stare at the fingertip and you can fuse the two images, you'll see that like a view master. Remember the old view masters? And it'll sort of look like it's in 3D. So you can try that at home. I can't do it. But the point that I'm making is, this is one of the things that happens in diabetes. These are called diabetic cataracts and they're hard to reverse. The other thing is if you diffuse alcohol and or water in and around the lens, you're going to have changes in the lens's index of refraction, which can give you these crazy refractive shifts in myopia and hyperopia. And so diabetics frequently will tell you, even if they don't know they're diabetic, as maybe a clue, hey, all of a sudden I can't see, and you find a large myopic or hyperopic shift as a result of this process. Here is one of our polling questions. Mark will read it to you. Which of the polling I will, I will launch it for you. What I meant was Joe will read it to you. Which of the following statements is true with respect to diabetic cataract formation? They typically form in only one eye, generally involve only the anterior capsule, they really form in diabetics. They're very slow to form. And I don't know, that's why I'm here. <laughs> and that's one of the, one of the uh, responses that we have added based upon audience response, guys. Now, a question, a question had come in. Does that mean di di that diabetics should stay away from erythritol? No, the sugar alcohol, sorbitol, dulcetol are common things that are sweeteners that are put in diabetic candies. Um, and they are, when you take them in through the digestive tract, it's sort of like a vitamin, where when you take in a lot of these vitamins or supplements, believe it or not, most of them go out in your poop and they're not absorbed in that way. So those things are safe to do. And that's why those sweeteners are that way instead of with natural sugar which would then hurt the, the, the glycogen and glucose problem. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. And the majority say they generally involve the anterior capsule. Okay, guys, take it away. So just, just to comment on that, uh, diabetic cataracts are not all that common, I find in my practice, fortunately because of the good control, how well controlled folks are with regards to their blood glucose levels. And I think that more often times than not, when I see a patient that's complaining of a refractive change or reduced vision, it's not necessarily a diabetic cataract, primarily because of the good control uh, and the compliance level. Uh, these cataracts look a lot different, in my opinion, than a garden variety age-related cataract. So as, as the polling question said, they have a different location, they have a different presentation, they're not a garden variety age-related presentation. So we should be good at seeing those uh, in, in our practice with good experience. So this is what Andy was talking about. Part of this process, this cyclical process that he outlined a few slides ago with how uh, we eat something and it gets turned into glucose and it gets to, uh, it stimulates the release of uh, insulin in our pancreas. And then you see here with tissue dehydration, because the end tissue is not receiving uh, blood, the, 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 the chemical it needs to have fuel that Andy outlined, the glucose, 
uh, and the glucose ends up being high in the blood system and it goes back to the, the kidney, as you see here, and we have to get rid of it one way or another. And that's historically uh, some of the early uh, findings with diabetes. Uh, you're talking thousands of years BC when it was recognized early on that people had sweet urine. So back then, folks had to literally taste urine to taste the high level of sugars because it was just being released through the system and not processed appropriately at the end organ. Is it good? I never tasted it. It's not what I heard. Um, I, guess, I guess that's a, that's equivalent to doing finger tensions. Well, yes, yes. In a way, in a way, kind of, sort of. And so what you see here is the kidney is built to modify water. And so when you have this high glucose in your blood, glucose urea, uh, then or, uh, hyperglycemia, excuse me, then you wind up not being able to reabsorb the glucose for use. And so that's what puts it in the urine and gives you glucose urea as he just described. And it also, because you're dehydrating the tissues, gives you lots of pee. And so uh, that's why you go to the bathroom a lot. And if you go to the bathroom a lot and you're depositing a lot of water in the commode, you're always thirsty. And so that's something we call polydipsia. The other is, is you can frequently be hungry and that's called polyphagia. And so that's why, glu that's why diabetes, broken uh, uh, glucose metabolism, sustained hyperglycemia produces those problems. And so sustained hyperglycemia affects all of the things you see here. The one that's most important is diacylglycerol. And so diacylglycerol leads to inflammation. And so when you upregulate inflammation, you hurt a lot of other things. You get oxidative damage, and you get dysregulation of protein kinase C, which also upregulates inflammation. The thing that that does is it causes vasoconstriction. So not only are you hurting and poisoning the blood vessels, you make them smaller. And when you make them smaller, it leads to tissue hypoxia. All of this leads to interleukin-6, another chemokine, cytokine of inflammation. And when you don't wind up with blood vessels, being supported properly, being poisoned by the sugar alcohol that's being uh, created, proteins being glycated, function being compromised, you wind up with blood vasculature that is both constricted and becomes uh, different in its shape. You wind up with microaneurysms, blood vessels that are literally broken. The place where there's more capillaries per square millimeter other than the brain is the neurosensory retina. And so that's why we see retinopathy so prevalently in people with this broken system. And so unfortunately, whenever you have any hypoxia in the retina, you drop this chemical called vascular endothelial growth factor. There's always vascular endothelial growth factor in your retina. And everybody watching me right now and him and me, it's there but it's being regulated by the pigment epithelium. The pigment epithelium produces a chemical called pigment-derived epithelial factor. And this PEDF regulates BEGF. And so they're yin and yang. In diabetes, all of this inflammation pushes this one out of whack. And when that happens, you run the risk of making new blood vessels. And that's bad. I'm not going to talk about it now. I'm only going to show you that it happens. In a minute, after Mark gets done talking to you about how to avoid diabetes and how we manage it medically, I'll get into the retinal pathways and I'll show you why it happens and I'll show you why it's bad. And I think you already know that. One other thing that happens on this side is you have destabilization of your vitreous humor. And whenever you have destabilization of the vitreous humor and or it dehydrates and pulls on the back of the eye, you have the possibility of these vessels liberating fluid and retaining fluid, creating cystic macular edema. And so if you look at me and I go like this, you can't see me. And that's what happens when you wind up with these cysts of fluid intraretinally blocking light from getting to the photoreceptors to then create the retinal image. And so this is the genesis of diabetic maculopathy, 
and the genesis of proliferative retinopathy, the two things that can distort or ruin vision catastrophically. These are pericytes. Pericytes line themselves up along any capillary vessel and support it the same way that the framing that's made of wood supports the drywall in the room you're sitting in. And so you can only imagine that if something happened to the framing, the drywall would fall down, become flimsy, it would crash. And when these pericytes don't support the cells that make up the lumen and the exterior of this blood vessel, they balloon. And when they balloon, that's called microaneurysms. It's also called intraretinal microvascular abnormalities. Capillaries you wouldn't ordinarily see are now visible. And when these changes occur, then all the cells that are so elegantly knit together stretch. And when they stretch or become compromised, fluid leaks out. And when the fluid leaks out, we have that comparison that I just gave you, cystic edema blocking light the photoreceptors cannot undergo uh, the creation of that electronic impulse to create an image that will participate in the visual pathway to get back to occipital lobe. By the way, there are pericytes that support venules. At the same time that this is going on, when vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor, two hormones, or chemokines or cytokines that are released secondary to vasoconstriction, inflammation, and lack of oxygen out of balance with pigment-derived epithelial factor. They go to the capillaries and they say, we're not getting enough oxygen. The capillary responds by saying, okay, let me make an out pouching and we'll make more blood vessels. And so that's exactly what you see here. Alpha-5, beta-1 integrins create this outpouching of the capillary and you wind up with the capillary literally sprouting new arms as a response to the body saying, we don't have enough oxygen. I mean, the answer must be build new plumbing. And so that's what the body tries to do. The reason that it's bad is that the new blood vessels that you create, while it's a good strategy, you get bad execution. And so you wind up with these new blood vessels sort of poking themselves out of the neurosensory retina and then scaffolding themselves in between the vitreous humor and the posterior hyaloid face and then the nerve fiber layer and the internal limiting membrane of the neurosensory retina. So they grow up, hit the vitreous, and then scaffold down in between the two inside that potential space. And I think you can see that if you shake that up and this breaks, now you've got a big blob of blood with an avascular jelly and a neurosensory retina with an internal limiting membrane with no capability of getting rid of that. There's also no easy way for the blood to just sort of seep to the bottom of the eye. It just sort of sits there. And then that creates catastrophic vision loss. It creates you, you catastrophic vision loss. The other thing that happens is when those vessels scaffold onto the retina and in between the posterior hyaloid face and the internal limiting membrane of the retina, and you shake them enough, they can pull apart and we call that tractional retinal detachment and tractional retinal detachments are devastating, creating significant and very severe losses of vision. What we call in diabetes, what we call in diabetes, severe vision loss or SVL. And so that creates just catastrophic loss of vision that's typically not recoverable. And so this is why you want to prevent this rather than deal with it. The good news is in 2021, we have some tricks up our sleeve 
that may be able to help this situation. Here's your neurosensory retina. Here's your vitreous humor. This is the posterior hyaloid face. Here are your photoreceptors, rods and cones. Your retinal pigment epithelium. This is your choroid and Brooks membrane. And so these new vessels scaffold right into this space. The vitreous is heavy. And in older people, it's liquidy, right? So it's, it's very sloshy. The new blood vessels that are made are made from arterial material, which means that they have muscle in them. That means they're naturally contractile. And so between the vitreous slogging around, the vessels making fibrovascular tissues that are contractile and attached to these capillaries just begs for the release of blood in the wrong places and the pulling of the retina right out of the hole here, known as tractional retinal detachment. And, and that's why that is tragic. All of the rest of the changes that I have described to you from pericyte loss are what you see here. Intraretinal microvascular abnormalities. You're not supposed to see these capillaries. These capillaries shouldn't look like this. They should look like this right here. Where do you see any capillaries in that retina right there? You don't. You're not supposed to see these either. You have the release of fats, lipids, and plasma, and we see that as exudate. And so these are intraretinal. They're all in this column called the outer plexiform layer. The area where the axons of the photoreceptors are interdigitating with the dendrites of the horizontal bipolar and amacrine cells. And so they're also up in here where the axons of the horizontal bipolar and amacrine cells are interdigitating with the dendrites of the ganglion cells. And so this is very collimated as you can see. And so when you look at that from on top, you see dots. And that's why you see dot and blot hemorrhages. That's why you see exudate lipid, microaneurysms, intraretinal microvascular abnormality, and then fluid, which is cystic, which you have come to learn is clinically significant diabetic macular edema. One of the things that's often not remembered is that clinically significant diabetic macular edema is a cystic macular edema. And we'll show you this when we show you some OCTs of this. This is neovascularization of the disc. Andy, can we go back just for one second? Please? Sure, go ahead. One of the things I just want to make sure everybody pays attention to is much like um, my patients that I see every day at the VA, if you look closely at these vessels, you notice that these folks most oftentimes have more than one metabolic syndrome going on. And this looks like a hypertensive change, if you ask me. And, and you know, I'm gonna speak about this in a moment, but I think this picture accentuates that as a perfect example. And, you know, we all need to be aware when we're taking our medical histories, regardless if we practice in a chain or practice in a hospital, that most of our patients we're seeing that have this degree of retinopathy probably are not a standalone diabetic. They have other metab metabolic syndromes that are going on and, and compromising their system even more so. so. Go ahead. So this is neovascularization of the disc. And so again, all these vessels. One thing I want to point out to you is the reason that I would I would say to you. These look, it looks like Capellini, right? Like Capellini pasta, angel hair pasta, am I right? And so the other thing is you don't see one vessel sort of going from an artery to an artery or an artery to a vein. Th those would be called shunt or collateral vessels. This is sort of a meandering or a bunch of vessels that have grown here and you can see that they're all over the place. And so this is NBD or neovascularization of the disc and this is a frond, F-R-O-N-D, frond of neovascularization elsewhere. And so again, you can see sort of the same sort of thing. And so these blood vessels are leak, 
leaky. They're leaky <laughs> and weak. They're scaffolded in between the vitreous and the neurosensory retina. They're contractile. They're anchored in the neurosensory retina and they're being pulled on and they want to contract. And so the two things that can happen is rip or tear, creating vitreous hemorrhage, or they can rip or tear the retina off, tractional retinal detachment. Just to remind you, the three types of retinal detachment are tractional, serous, and regmatogenous. Regmatogenous, regma in Greek means whole. So you get a hole in your retina, fluid underneath lifts the whole thing up. Serous can occur from metabolic issues where you have fluid or transudate literally lift the neurosensory retina off of the RPE. And so that's a neurosensory retinal detachment without a hole. And this would be tractional retinal detachment from these fibrovascular tissues contracting and pulling the retina off. Here you can see that, and I wanna make sure that this is clear, right? All of these vascular endothelial growth factor, hormones, chemokines, cytokines, attractants that are trying to upregulate the plumbing don't just stay in the back of the eye. They actually uh, permeate forward. And when they permeate forward, they can actually cause the major and minor circles of the eye to grow new plumbing as well. And this is called rubiosis irides. And the reason that this is dangerous is if you get that fibrovascularization in your angle, this is your iris, this is your cornea, angle of the eye, you can actually have it zipper the angle closed. A very, very high IOP, uveitic pain with uveitic symptoms that requires a lot of pharmacology to regulate. It will require retinal treatment to remove it. And unfortunately, if it causes the eye to become blind, it can become chronic and painful and have the eye succumb becoming shrunken and disorganized, thesis bulbi, requiring a nucleation. And so that picture is called neovascular glaucoma and hopefully we want to avoid it. And you can see rubiosis irides here and here. By the way, what often happens is it pulls the, like you're seeing right here, the pupillary border outward like this. That has a name, it's called ectropion uvea. Just for trivia, if you see what looks like ectropion uvea in a person that has a normal iris without any neovascularization, that has a name too. It's called flocculus, F-L-O-C-U-L-O-S, L-U-S, flocculus, flocculus. And so this would be ectropion, UVA, rubiosis irides, neovascularization of the iris, NVI, probably with NVA. And so the biggest thing that you can do for your patients in these circumstances is to prevent diabetes. Now you can do that by saying, lose weight, eat the right food, keep your blood sugar consistently under 140. <laughs> If any of you've ever seen my lecture before, you know that I used to say, keep your blood pressure under one, blood sugar under 120. However, <clears throat> my wife is diabetic and every time she uses that blood thing, the meter never reads under 140. When she wakes up in the morning, it doesn't read under 140. I'm thinking it's broken or sabotaged. So you gotta give the patient something that's realistic some realistic sort of approach. The other thing you have to do is what he's going to tell you through studies and that you have to moderate the other systemic issues that go with diabetes, which is mainly hypertension and cholesterol. And so I'm going to turn the program over to my partner and he's going to talk to you about diabetes regulation, prevention, studies, and then I'll be back to tell you about how to manage it all. So the last couple slides that Andy went over, particularly the slides with neovascularization and iris, I think neglect, uh, when I see that, either the patient neglected uh, to go to their examinations or a primary care doctor neglected to diagnose them with diabetes, 
uh, or a provider didn't do a proper examination and all that's neglect. And the reason why is because we have what's right in front of us here. Nowadays, uh, with all medicine, early detection and early intervention is what's preventing all of these late stage complications that we're going to go over. And that Andy touched on some to this point. So when we have an annual physical, when I go from annual physical, I get a CBC and they include these types of studies as well, blood glucose studies, right? And usually it's a fasting plasma glucose you see there in the middle, right? That's when they only after midnight, go in, they do a blood stick and they get our, my fasting blood glucose. You see there in the green, that less than 100, that's a normal fasting blood glucose that we should have. Uh, a term that's thrown around a significant amount of the time and statistically speaking in the United States of America, it's a huge percentage of our population. You see 100 to 126 milligrams per deciliter. That's an impaired fasting blood glucose. Many patients call that pre-diabetic. Uh, there's a lot of people in my practice that I see are pre-diabetic. And I think if we monitor, if we had most Americans go for their annual physical and get this number, I believe there's about 10% of the American population around 34 million diabetics right now. And there's probably at least that that are not diagnosed and at least that that have pre-diabetic, pre-diabetes pre numbers. What well, you see in the bottom there, that millimoles per liter, that's just in case you're in uh, the conversation from a, con a, a country that uh, uses the metric system like the Canadians. The Canadians use millimoles per liter versus uh, milligrams per deciliter, just for the record. So that's a Excuse me, Mark, Mark, I just want to, I'm going to throw something out if you don't mind. No, not at all. <clears throat> Andy mentioned, you know, his wife being diabetic. You know, I've got a family history of diabetes. So I can tell you very frequently, I, I might be 99. I might, on my fasting blood might be 205, uh, 105, one, you know, uh, 103, 102, somewhere around there. But my, my hemoglobin is under five. You know, it's like 4.7, 4.8. So what do you make of that? You know, do well, I fall under pre-diabetes or, or not? Well, that, that was, that's a good segue into the next comment, Joe. And if you had those types of numbers, your primary care provider would be uh, appropriate to say, you know what, I don't like your numbers to the point where you're a little bit on the uh, pre-diabetic. But with that said, if year after year, you're coming with that number and never in the 125 or plus range, they're probably okay with that. But if they were prudent, they would order an A1C because that 90 day uh, glucose number, that percentage that you see there in the green being normal, and you said you're always below five, I think you could rest easy and you wouldn't necessarily be declared a, a, a uh, impaired fasting blood glucose patient or pre-diabetic. Yeah, I, I, I just always run a little bit high, like the yep. 102, not, sometimes 99, 97, 105, but I'm always under five. And you know, you, you and I get a check frequently. You, you know, Mark, you made a, a comment about your annual physical. Yep. I want my annual physical to be done three times a year. I do my wellness exams. I get my blood drawn. You know, drawn three times a year. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really important because, you know, once, you know, once you start playing in the third quarter, you know, you've got to work hard to, uh, to make overtime. Well, there's no question about that. And that, and again, that's, that's a comment well said because we're detecting earlier. And I say this to my patients all the time. And I mentioned this during these presentations, I graduated in 1999 and working in North Philadelphia, everyone has high blood pressure, high cholesterol and diabetes practically that walks in the, in the eye clinic. Uh, and, and it's, pretty similar where I work now at a VA hospital. But what's different is the multi-prong approach and earlier detection of diabetics. Just for example, when a person is diagnosed with diabetes after having a fasting plasma glucose and a hemoglobin A1C that's abnormal, they see eye care, they see foot care, they see a dietitian, they, they get an exercise clinic, and then they see their primary care providers no less than twice a year. So that's, that's a, a, a real comprehensive approach because as you said, you don't wanna get behind, you wanna get ahead of diabetes and not let it control your life and have a downward spiral. With that said, I mentioned this a little bit ago about the metabolic syndromes. You know, There's a syndrome X where people don't necessarily have full-blown diabetes and full-blown hypertension and high cholesterol that requires medical management, but it puts these people in this syndrome X, where they have these metabolic risk factors. And 
it, it goes without saying, the one thing you cannot control are your genetics. You cannot control hereditary influences and, and genetics. We're just predisposed to certain things. And regardless, if you are a vegetarian and you exercise, you could still have hypercholesterolemia just because you lost the genetic lottery, okay? So I talked about the A1C. You see there that number below 5.7. Hemoglobin A1C is the 90-day sugar test between 5.7 and 6.5 and over 6.5. That's pretty much a confirming study and a study that's used to monitor long-term uh, glucose control. Pregnant uh, patients have oral glucose tolerance tests at some point during their pregnancy. And you'll see there under 140, what happens there? A glucose solution is drank. And after uh, a half hour, an hour, and two hours, those numbers are reviewed. And again, this is a confirming study. This is not the primary study used, but between 140 and 200 is uh, impaired fasting blood glucose and over 200. So Andy mentioned a little bit, he did a little preview and the primary prevention, and really technically, if we're talking to a patient about it, who is at risk of diabetes, it's secondary prevention because they're in that at-risk category, is change of lifestyle. I can tell you that Change of lifestyle is on paper a very good approach and should be a component of all management. Uh, but I can tell you that if you're 65 years old, you don't exercise, you don't eat right, uh, people aren't about to change abruptly like that. It's just hard to get people to change, even though we're showing them pictures of their fundus, we're talking to them about statistics and studies, it's very hard, but it's absolutely worth the discussion. And it's part of the equation. It's part of the equation, changing lifestyle somewhat to get off the couch, get some exercise and change lifestyle and diet as you'll see here. Uh, you know, we always joke around, Andy and I eat things that are pick, uh, packed, not picked. So, you know, you don't go and have a burger at a fast food joint a couple of times a week. That's what I said. I said, I, I changed it. I changed it. I said, pick, eat things that are picked, not packed. So the bananas and the fruits there, and, and the vegetables are picked versus the things that are packed that you buy off the counter and shove in our mouth while we're on the go first thing in the morning stopping at a convenience store. So balancing our diet. Everything in moderation, right? We don't, it's impossible to change our lifestyles 180 degrees in most cases. So counseling people about everything in moderation. And the reason uh, we have these conversations is because evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine has been applied through diabetes more so than probably any other diagnosis, uh, systemic diagnosis. And just some of the early studies you see here, the diabetes control complication trial, uh, the DCCT was done with type one diabetics and it showed without question, the people who know what their blood glucose numbers are, do best and have the fewest complications. The Wisconsin eye disease study and the United Kingdom perspective diabetic study were studies that include type two diabetics that further confirmed blood sugar control. So the DCCT uh, included type one diabetics, the WES and the UK PDS included type two diabetics. So when I have my patients, I ask them the same arsenal of questions. How long have you been diabetic? What medicines are you on? And I ask that not to know the actual every single name, but if they're on oral medicines or injectables, because that's an indication of how compromised uh, their control may be. Uh, and I also ask them when they measured their last blood glucose. And they're like, well, I don't like to stick my finger. Uh, it hurts. And you know, I'll talk about the alternatives to that, the modern alternatives to that in a moment. But the, the, the crux of the message is that knowing your blood glucose matters and knowing how to control it. Euclid looked at um, the control of cholesterol medications and how cholesterol control, as I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, the, the multiple metabolic presentation that if you have diabetes and you have cholesterol issues, controlling both helps both. If you're out of control in one, it's going to affect the other, regardless of what, if the hyper, hyper cholesterolemia is out of control, it's going to affect your blood sugar. If your blood sugar is out of control, it's going to affect your cholesterol. And the same is true with the Aspen study that looked at cardiovascular status. So hypertension. So these studies further confirmed control. A major study was the ACCORD study. The action, the action to control cardiovascular risk and diabetes was not a NEI study, it was an NIH study, but that looked at all three in one full swoop. And what was interesting about the ACCORD study, one arm of the ACCORD study was stopped because we talked to our patients and we counsel our patients about their hemoglobin A1Cs being under seven. Well, there was a tight control arm of that study where patients with hypertension 
and diabetes were asked to control their blood glucose to under six. And that was actually too tight. And some people had hypoglycemic events and they had some cardiovascular complications. And there was a clinically significant number of fatalities in that arm and that was stopped. The remaining arms continued and those arms confirmed, as we mentioned, that metabolic control of all three matters. So that's important. Now let's spend some time talking about the medicines. We're, we're gonna spend a few minutes on the medicines. We're just gonna talk about pretty much reverse engineering what Andy did earlier. So Andy talked about what is, what, why diabetes occur. Oh, we have a test question first, Joe. All right, <clears throat> I will launch that. Poll number two. Which statement is correct about DCCT? Vocal lasers performed in ca for cases of cystoid macular edema. Tight control on the sugar level improves retinopathy immediately. Tight control on sugar is helpful against formation of retinopathy. Fluorescent angiography is necessary before PRP. I'm not sure, that's why I'm here. <clears throat> and I think this is actually test question number 32 on the NBEO part one. <laughs> I wouldn't hey, remember. Hey, Mark, you're one tough monkey. <laughs> hey, listen, man, this is, listen, it's Sunday night. We're, we're, we're bringing it. We're, we're bringing the heat, baby. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked me easy questions. <laughs> no layups. We don't have layups in this game. Okay, Joe, next time it'll be true false for you guys, okay? Oh, by the way, you'll never get a 100% right answer on anything. That's okay. Just historical. All right, we did really well. Uh, everybody is responding very, very nicely. You got a couple more people rolling in. I'm going to let them. Uh, okay, I'm going to end the poll right now and I'm going to share the results. Eye control is helpful. Very good. Very good. Well done, folks. Well done. I think I made that pretty clear, though. Okay, Roland. So Andy mentioned earlier some of the mechanisms as why, of why um, diabetes occurs. And you know, what's really interesting is that next Sunday, December 12th, is the 100th year anniversary that two Canadian physicians, Banting, Frederick Banting and Charles Best, discovered insulin. The first hormone, I believe, discovered in the human body. And I believe they went on to uh, get a Nobel Prize for Medicine because of their discovery. And next Sunday is the 100th year anniversary where they contacted the American Society of Physiology and said, we're on to something here. And it was looked at for years of what was causing diabetes and they, and they discovered insulin and they recognized that it was the culprit. Either way, these are the four main med ways medicine work. Uh, control of glucose absorption, you see at the 12 o'clock position, at the three o'clock position is glucose uptake. And that was Andy's comments about you have insulin, uh, 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 you have glucose that's not in the correct form and it can't be taken up. Uh, insulin secretion at the level of the pancreas, the beta cells of the pancreas and glucose production. Okay, so at the VA, the first line of medicine and most oftentimes in the community, the first line of medicine is metformin. As you see, it's highlighted there, metformin is a biguanide and it has dual action which makes it a very good medicine. It does come with side effects. And by the way, it's worth mentioning that all of these medicines can contribute to an event of hypoglycemia. And that's why there's monitoring done. At RVA, we have pharmacists who are PharmDs, doctors of pharmacy, who, who co-manage patients and make sure they're on their medicines and their glucose is at a targeted number that's safe. So metformin is a biguanide. It increases uh, it actually reduces, you see the downward arrow, it's a bigonide that decreases glucose production. And then you see it increases glucose uptake. Okay, that's, that's the first line, it's safe, it's cost-effective and it's very efficacious. The second medicines are the sulfonylureas, glipizide and gliburide, that's, that's glucophage. I'm sorry, that's, that's uh, um, glucophage is metformin, but that's uh, gliburide and glipizide are medicines that are the same way. Uh, they're very cost effective and they have a long history and they're sulfonylureas. So this is where the type two diabetics uh, are only the type of diabetic that would be on a pill 
because we know type one diabetics, we can't increase insulin secretion because there's no insulin to increase. So these medicines are spontaneous and they increase any insulin production that does exist at the level of the pancreas. That's usually the add-on of the second line medicine. Pioglitazone and rosiglitazone are the thiazolidine diones, the TZDs. You see they're just like metformin where they have dual action, okay? And then acarbose and megalitol. These are alpha glucosidase inhibitors. And when you eat a meal, you eat a big jug of pasta or plate of pasta with a bunch of sauce on it that's loaded with sugars and carbohydrates. And when it hits your gut, this slows down the process of absorption at the level of the stomach and the small intestine. So the body can have a gradual intake of, of, of your food and could begin processing those carbohydrates and turning them into sugars at a more controlled rate. So your system, for lack of a better word, isn't overrun uh, with this intake. So these medicines have a role in slowing down. And oftentimes these are in addition uh, to metformin because they work differently uh, versus uh, like the TZDs that are redundant with metformin. Uh, Repetiglin and, and netoglenide are medicines that are megalotinides, and you see there, they're also stimulating uh, insulin release at the level of the pancreas. Uh, some of the new medicines are the uh, injectables for diabetics. And what's interesting about these medicines, they're extremely effective. They are taken with caution because they can have side effects. Some people have GI issues, some people have hypoglycemic events, and they're more so than anything expensive. And some people like these medicines, I find, and some people don't like them because they're sticking themselves again with a the needle. These are small needles. Uh, these are injectable pens. They're not like uh, a subcutaneous injection that with, with an actual syringe. So these are kind of a quick uh, stick and, and they're, they're very efficacious, but they're a little more expensive. And there's more and more of these coming out of the market. Biduron is another medication uh, that you see there, that's in a syringe form, but there's a lot of medicines now on the market. Uh, that are injectables engineered for type two diabetics for better control and less frequent dosing. Some of the medicines are one week um, injectables. And again, uh, some of those are the DPP-4 inhibitors and you see them listed there. These medicines are and, and they do a good job, but the patients absolutely, if you're on these, pa if you're on these medications, these patients are mandated to start checking their blood glucose levels. If not, they're flirting with hypoglycemia. And then we have the different formulations of, of uh, insulins, immediate acting, short acting, and long acting insulins. And, and they're usually the last kind of go-to for the medicines for the type two diabetics. Uh, so those are the medicines. You have to review those with your patients, make sure they're taking their medicines properly. Uh, and and you know, coordinating with the primary care provider, I have the luxury at the VA of just looking in the patient's charts. If they're telling me they're on a medicine, I could always look in their medical chart and see uh, what they're on through the pharmacy. Uh, you may not have that luxury depending on your electronic medical records, but it's a good way to communicate. And we should be communicating because patients are requested to have annual diabetic eye examinations. And if I'm not mistaken, most uh, insurance companies require the primary care provider to get that documentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Andy for a little bit. We're going to talk about the history of how we intervene when it comes to diabetic eye findings in the post-tier segment. So, uh, hi folks. Um, this is Gerd Meyer Schwickerath. Gerd Meyer Schwickerath was an ophthalmologist who was practicing in Germany in Hamburg at the University of Hamburg. And what he uh, used to see were people that stared at solar eclipses. And at some point he, he wondered, actually in the literature, if you study Gerdmeier Schwickerath's, uh, his work, he, he used to stay up at night and wonder what could be happening that's blinding these people. And it came to him that something must be causing the photoreceptors to agglutinate or burn. He actually named this light coagulation. And so this is a solar burn. And so this is what he used to look at. This is a solar eclipse. 
And so it's very similar to you, you know, uh, burning a hole in a leaf with a magnifying glass. You know, when you look at the sun, what makes you look away from the sun is that it's so damn bright. So you, you look up and it's, it's bright, so you look away. When you have a solar eclipse, the damaging UVA, UVB, and UVC that are coming to your eye are the same, but the stimulus for you to turn away has been eliminated. And so what happens is those rays are focused by your crystalline lens the way we're doing here. And the RPE cannot dissipate the heat. And it literally fries your macula. At the same time, as Gerdmeier Schwickerath is coming up through ophthalmology in Germany, he notices that lots and lots of people are catastrophically going blind. And he thinks to himself, what are we going to do? I'll tell you how bad it was, folks, according to the literature. They were aborting fetuses because pregnant women who had diabetes got proliferative retinopathy so bad, it was likely they were going to lose their vision through vitreous hemorrhage, proliferative retinopathy, and fractional retinal detachment. And they thought in their mind, maybe we should terminate the pregnancy to save the mother's vision. That, that's how bad it was. Consider this, in the year 2021, diabetes is still the number one cause of acquired visual disability in people who are 20 to 65. It's not worldwide, that's in the United States. Worldwide, it's cataract and ocular surface disease. But here in the United States, diabetes remains a significant problem. And so Gerdmeier Schwickerath thinks to himself, if the sun can photocoagulate or light coagulate this area here, and the problem is bleeding in the eye from diabetes, I wonder if I can coagulate those blood vessels with sunlight. And so he takes people up onto the University of Hamburg's roof, sets up a contraption where he puts on a head mirror and he focuses the rays of light into the eye. Here I have this picture of a of an a, a, a otolaryngologist, eye, ear, nose, and throat bear, or an ear, nose, and throat person looking in your throat. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, but he, he did it to your eye. And I'll tell you, he burned the living hell out of a lot of eyes. But he did stop the bleeding. And so this leads him to work with a emerging budding technology company that works on optics and lenses on this thing called the xenon gas discharge lamp. This is the first prototype of the idea of a laser. Oh. And this is what leads to lasing. Lasing is when you take a chamber filled with a lasing medium, xenon, argon, some sort of tunable gas. You raise the energy inside the gas with an energy source. When these molecules take on this extra energy and then you take the energy away, the electron that has been elevated to the, to the mm. top shell is then let off. And if you put them in a column and the column's really small, they all go in the same direction. And then if you open the tube, they go out. And they go out with tremendous energy. And remember, three things happen to every light source. That source can be transmitted. That source can be reflected. That's how you're seeing me now. Or it can be absorbed. And when that energy is absorbed, then, then there's some action on the other end. Now, you know if you leave a light next to a wall and then touch the wall, the wall's hot. If you put the right amount of energy into this area, as did the sun, you'll get light coagulation, ah, ah, photocoagulation. And that's how the idea of lasing is born. 
This is around 1946 when Gerd Meyer Schwickerath is sort of making this, this leap. And he's literally doing it in some primitive way in Germany. This laser doesn't become invented till the late 1950s. These two guys are Novotny and Elvis. They've heard about using this inert molecule called fluorescein in cardiac procedures. And they think to themselves, why can't we use it in the eye? And they come up with this way, oh, by the way, I just wanted to show you, um, this is a binocular headlamp, a head mirror. I just thought it was funny. When I was doing all the research with this, I found the single binocular, or the single uh, uh, what's called head mirror. And then I found a binocular head mirror, like a binocular indirect, a, a binocular head mirror, modern technology. This is the, literally the roof of, of Hamburg, the University of Hamburg, where Gerdmeyer Schwickerath did those experiments. And so these two guys, Novotny and Avis, realized that if they put an exciter filter in front of the flash of the camera, the energy that leaves this camera will be converted to blue light, which will excite the fluorescein that they've just injected in your arm. The fluorescein will fluoresce at 535 to 560 nanometers and come back to the camera. And if they put a film, a barrier filter in front of the film plane, all you will see is fluorescein. Novotny and Elvis. Why is this important? Because there are five phases to the fluorescein angiogram and each one of those phases can show you if the capillaries are competent or leaking. Not only that, but when you get into the later phases of the angiogram, it'll show you if the capillaries are oozing. If the angiogram is getting more greater intensity and larger over time, it shows you where the leakage is. So let me put this together for you. In the 1960s, we've developed a laser. We've developed a way to figure out if it's leaking or it's dead. Because what this also shows you is if there isn't any fluorescein in the system. If you get hypofluorescence, then it's a good deal that the tissue's probably dead because it had no vascular source. And so we've got this way to aim light to coagulate things that are leaking and causing trouble as we've described. And we've got a way to find what's leaking. I love it. This is the hygienic laboratory. In the years of 1785 to close to 1800, Adams, takes control of the country. And he's plagued by sick people, particularly, particularly around the port of call in the budding United States of America. And so what he does is he taxes the sailors between two and 20 cents a piece. And he, he takes that money and he builds something called the Marine Health Service. The Marine Health Service will have a bunch of different places that gather data just to see who's sick around the ports of call in America. And all that information will be sent to the Hygienic Laboratory in Staten Island, New York. At this particular time, there is no discipline of mathematics called statistics. This fellow here is Benjamin Henry Harrison. He's the president of the United States around 1901. And he says, you know what we should do? We should move this hygienic laboratory down to Bethesda, Maryland. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you an astronomical sum of money to do it. I'll give you $35,000. 
So I don't know, back in those days, maybe that was like 200 million. How do I know? But it was a lot of money. I'll tell you what, it was enough to buy this 35 acre campus in Bethesda, Maryland, where the National, where the National Institutes of Health now sits. In 1930, this is Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover commissions more money and he converts the Marine Health Service to the United States Public Health Service. And he renames this the National Institutes of Health. In between these dates, Einstein comes up with his theories of relativity, both special and uh, just relativity and special relativity. And in between these two dates, the discipline of statistical mathematics comes. The hygienic laboratory, now called the National Institutes of Health, has all this data and they can start chugging through the data to understand if things are happening not by chance. This is Lyndon Johnson, or excuse me, this is Harry Truman. Harry Truman, during his presidency, somewhere after the Second World War, allows the National Institutes of Health to break down into individual colleges within the National Institutes of Health. In 1968, 69, Lyndon Johnson, recognizing ophthalmology's wanting to break away from ophthalmology and otolaryngology, commissions the National Eye Institute of the National Institutes of Health. And this is the National Eye Institute's campus in Bethesda, Maryland. It's probably one of these buildings here, judging by the color. The, the National Institutes of Health has a $42 billion a year budget. The National Eye Institute of the National Institutes of Health has $685 million budget, and that's remained relatively stable. This has basically doubled over the last 20 years. It was 20 billion in 2005. Now you have all the components. We understand that diabetes produces two problems, proliferative retinopathy that bleeds or tears the retina off, or abnormal capillaries, which leak fluid and block light from getting to the retina, stopping the graded action potential from getting into the visual pathway. And in those two ways, it has the potential to catastrophically affect vision or take away visual acuity. We have data. The data tells us that this new technique of coagulating the vessels actually works to save vision and prevent additional losses. And now we have the formation of the National Eye Institute to see if that's the case. And so the very first study ever commissioned by the National Eye Institute, the National Institutes of Health in 1972 is the diabetic retinopathy study. They take 1,700 patients and they ask two questions. One, does panretinal photocoagulation reduce the risk of severe vision loss in case of proliferative retinopathy? And two, what are the high-risk characteristics that should be lasered? This is a laser photocoagulation scar. And we know in 2001 from the classic works of Stephenson, from Scandinavia, that there are two methods that photocoagulation actually works based on the classic works of Schwickerath. One, it burns the choroid, the RPE, and retina to a degree where it dies and atrophies. So one, when you put in 2100 burns like you see on your screen with large power and big diameter burns, the, these burns, as you can see, are about a third of a disc diameter in size and they're done with like 700 milliwatts of power. And you put them in, two things happen. One, the retina there no longer needs the blood. 
so you can shunt the blood to other places where it's needed, stopping the ischemia and the hypoxia that I talked to you about earlier. And two, oxygen that's in the unaffected choroid can percolate through to the retina and be used in the retina like a joker, like a wild card to cause the retina to be able to maintain its homeostasis. The DRS recruited 1,700 patients and it found that if you did panretinal photocoagulation, you reduced the risk of severe vision loss in this study. Severe vision loss was uh, described or defined as 5,200 or worse, 5,200 or worse. You reduced the risk of severe vision loss to 5,200 or worse by 50%, 50%. And so the high risk characteristics were defined as neovascularization of the disc, a quarter to a third of a disc area in size or greater, anywhere within a disc area of the disc. Or neovascularization elsewhere with any vitreous hemorrhage. And those high risk characteristics stand up to this day. I offer you this caveat for me personally. If I see neovascularization of the disc of any size or neovascularization elsewhere, anywhere, whether there's vitreous hemorrhage or not, it goes to the retina specialist. And so the diabetic retinopathy study proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that panretinal photocoagulation works. And this is the right choice, not by chance. This is the birth of evidence-based medicine in ophthalmology. Here you can see our picture of neovascularization of the disc. Clearly a quarter to a third of a disc area in size or greater, clearly a disc area in size. Here you see large frond of neovascularization elsewhere. Remember, it's scaffolded in between the neurosensory retina and the vitreous humor, just waiting to tear it off or have this large vitreous hemorrhage enlarge. This is a fibrovascular lesion. Here you can see fibrovascularization and the tremendous traction that it's putting on this retina right here. Now, even though there is no vitreous hemorrhage like you see on the other side, where you have neovascularization elsewhere with vitreous hemorrhage, neovascularization of the disc with, with a hemorrhage over the nerve, and neovascularization of the disc again with vitreous hemorrhage, even though you don't see any vitreous hemorrhage here, there's only one way that that fibrovascular tissue can get there. And that's by neovascularization proliferative retinopathy. And if you don't stop this, it will tear the retina off or you're going to wind up with a large vitreous hemorrhage that categorically and catastrophically ruins vision. There's nothing to reabsorb the blood. Here you can see that that very thing has happened. And this is all fibrovascular tissue that has proliferated. This person, believe it or not, has good vision. This person has 2040 vision with all this catastrophic change. And there is no tractional retinal detachment yet. This is all traction and traction from the fibrovascular proliferation without the retina coming off yet. And here is another one with a large vitreous hemorrhage down low and a small vitreous hemorrhage here with fibrovascular traction and no retinal detachment yet, but tremendous pulling, proliferative retinopathy, even a Roth spot, white centered hemorrhage. And so in these cases, what you need to do is pan retinal photocoagulation. And I, I, I stop for a minute, I stop for a minute because in the 2021, before you catastrophically laser the crap out of a retina, you probably should treat it with vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor first, see how much regression you get, and then follow it up with some laser only because laser is so damaging. Remember, every time you put a burn in large power, large spot size, you get 35% enlargement of the damage area. So if you put in a spot this big, you get collateral damage that's this big. And so that's why it's, 
it's the, the new vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitors offer us such promise. There's a new technique out there called micropulse laser. I'll discuss that a little bit later in the program. This is four to one rule. I just gave you the high risk characteristics, neovascularization of the disc, a quarter to a third of a disc area in size or greater anywhere within a disc area of the disc, neovascularization elsewhere with any vitreous hemorrhage. Don't have to remember that. Be a good optometrist. If you see neovascularization of vitreous hemorrhage, send them to the retina specialist. You don't have to remember that egghead stuff. This is four to one rule. Four to one rule says if you have four quadrants of moderate to severe non-proliferative retinopathy, two quadrants of venous beating, which you're seeing right here, or one quadrant of IRMA, intraretinal microvascular abnormalities, where you can see capillaries that you're not supposed to see. That is on the cusp of becoming high risk retinopathy, send them to retinology, even though they may or may not have vitreous hemorrhage. By the way, these are large intraretinal hemorrhages. There's no vitreous hemorrhage here. And so I just wanted to show you, here's a case where there's nothing. Here's a case where there's proliferative retinopathy and a vitreous hemorrhage. Here they've laid in the burns and you can see some of the burns right here. It takes 10 weeks for those burns to mature. And here you can see all of this dries up over time. So panretinal photocoagulation works. It's just caustic. And so to summarize, the diabetic retinopathy study told us without question, if you see the high risk characteristics, that's neovascularization, this neovascularization elsewhere, send it to the retinologist who will determine in 2021 if they need vascular endothelial growth factor injection followed by laser and or both, maybe some other things like steroids as well. And we'll talk, I promise we'll talk about that as we close on the time. The diabetic retinopathy study was the first study ever done, and it ran from 1972 to 1976. There were shortcomings. Something else takes your vision in diabetes, and it's macular edema. Macular edema is when you get cystic fluid that comes from the compromised capillaries from all that pathophysiology I described in the beginning of the program. Panretinal photocoagulation not only doesn't help it, it makes it worse. So there's got to be another treatment for diabetic macular edema, something that's separate, something that's different than what you're doing for proliferative retinopathy. And so the other thing is, is the diabetic retinopathy study never mentioned anything about timing. If I see the high-risk characteristics, should I treat immediately? Should I wait? How much time should I allow? Maybe if I think the diabetes is going south, I should treat beforehand. And so the National Eye Institute of the National Institute of Health decided the right thing to do was to do a follow-up study and call it the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study. And so from 1979 to 1989, this time they enlisted 3,000 patients. Now I can tell you to get my professor level promotion, I had to do original research. And when I did original research, I had a whopping, and I hope you're all sitting down, I had a whopping 20 patients. And I can tell you, it was aggravation from the word go. I can't imagine what 3,000 patients spread across the country must have been like. But the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study was designed to answer four questions. One, when's the right time to do panretinal photocoagulation for people with proliferative retinopathy? I'll give you the answer when you see it, not before, when you see it, except for four, two, one rule. The other three questions had to do with what to do with macular edema from non-proliferative retinopathy. And that was one, 
what is clinically significant macular edema that requires treatment? And you can see down here, thickening, thickening, thickening. I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to show you the diagram from the paper. Two, the question was, would focal photocoagulations, small spots, small power, spots 50 microns in size, not, 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 not 300 micron spot size, 50 micron spot size, not 700 milliwatts of power, 100 milliwatts of power, small spots, small power. Would focal photocoagulation work to reduce or arrest vision loss in people with clinically significant macular edema? And the last question, would aspirin and its anticoagulation effects reduce the risk of retinopathy? I'm gonna give you the answer to those things right now. The study demonstrated that focal photocoagulation was so effective that halfway through the study, they stopped randomizing people and they thought that it would be unethical to continue the study without treating all patients. It was that clear. Now I know Myers told you that the DCCT and the way you control diabetes with all the medicines that he mentioned is the key to stopping retinopathy. The tighter you control the sugar, the more likely you are to arrest the formation of retinopathy. And now I'm telling you that if you wind up with somebody with maculopathy, according to the ETDRS, the appropriate thing to do is to get focal photocoagulation. Now I wanna to mention to you for completeness that panretinal photocoagulation or PRP has an alternate name. The alternate name is called scatter photocoagulation. You, you might hear your retina specialist say, I gave them scatter photocoagulation, same thing. The same thing is also true for focal photocoagulation. Sometimes when you're doing a fluorescein angiogram to aim the laser at the spots that leaking with the small spots and small power, when you, when you wanna aim the laser at those leaking little hyperfluorescent dots, it oozes so much that you can't tell exactly where to aim the laser. And so what you do is you put down a grid. And so focal photocoagulation is synonymous with the term grid. Focal or grid, PRP scatter. And so the ETDRS has ruled the land, has ruled the land. The ETDRS created clinically significant macular edema, and here it is. Oh, first we have a, we have a, 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 a question, but before I answer mm -hmm. that question, let me tell you the answers here. Timing was when you see it, focal worked. We stopped the study because it was unethical to continue to treat patient when it was so obvious it worked. ETDRS, uh, clinically significant macular edema, I'm gonna define for you in two seconds, thickening, 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 I'm gonna do that in a second. And that aspirin was not successful in reducing retinopathy. However, what the study determined was, if you need to take aspirin so that your coagulation system is in proper balance, so that your um, circulatory system, your cardiovascular system it is not, is not becoming coagulated, you can, and it doesn't cause retinopathy to be any worse. With that said, you should be able to answer the next question. And here, here's poll number three. What did it say about taking aspirin? It was beneficial in small doses, had no beneficial in reducing retinopathy, was controversial, reduced nep nep nephropathy. And choice five should be, I don't know. That's why I'm here tonight. So I see that it's 8.30. And so we go to nine. And we no, will, we go to 8.45. Oh, 8.45. I, I want to tell you, we'll be on time. We'll, we'll, we'll be on time. We're, we're, we're right at the end now. So, so I'm very happy with things. Can I move on? Hold on. Well, wait just a second. We got a few more people weighing in. Okay. How much more material do you have? About 15 minutes? Yeah, probably less. You can go the full 15. Roger. All right, 15. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. There we are.
Yeah, you, you guys all got it. That's exactly right. Um, it really doesn't, it really, the idea was, is if you made the circulatory system more slippery, maybe you'd get oxygen permeating in the right places and you'd reduce retinopathy. Um, and it didn't work. It, it did not have any benefits on retinopathy, but it doesn't hurt to take it. And so here's what happens in clinically significant maculopathy. You have these microaneurysms, which I described to you earlier, and you have intraretinal microvascular abnormalities because the pericytes are dying. They're being poisoned by the sugar alcohols. We talked about that. And so it's right here in the outer plexiform layer. And I told you what that was. And so you get all this cystic fluid that builds up and it causes your photoreceptors, instead of to be like this, to be all cockamamie, to be crooked. And that creates a visual issue called the Stiles Crawford effect, which causes your visual acuity to drop, let alone the fact that the light's got to get through the cysts. And so the idea is how do you stop this from happening and at the same time not blind the patient? And so the answer is focal or grid photocoagulation. And here is the actual grid that came from the paper that you see below. And so here is the fovela. And so the answer was clinically significant macular edema, thickening, 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 thickening at or within 500 micrometers of the center of the fovela. 500 micrometers is a third of a disc diameter. The average optic disc is 1500 micrometers. So thickening at or within 500 micrometers of the center of the fovela. Any exudates at or within 500 micrometers of the center of the fovela if there's any thickening. And finally, an area of thickening that's a disc area or greater in size within a disc area of the center of the fovela. And so if you see any of those three things, off to the retinologist they would go, they would get a fluorescein angiogram, they would see if things were leaky. They would see hyperfluorescent dots, usually in the arteriovenous phase of the angiogram, that would increase it in size and intensity over the course of the angiogram. And then they would either give you focal laser if they could aim right at that area that was leaking or a grid. Now, I got to tell you, you never sent anybody back in those days to the retina specialist to say, I'm sending you there so that you uh, get better vision. You Back in those days, you sent them to the retina specialist saying, I'm gonna send you to the retina specialist so you don't lose any more vision. Because it was possible that the laser could have a damaging effect on vision. However, if you didn't do it, the risk that you would, what was called back in those days, double the visual angle, like 2040 would go to 2080. 2050 would go to 2100 was virtually 70%. So you were better off doing it and aborting it than watching it. Now, at any time, it can spontaneously abort. But with those odds, I, wouldn't, I, I would want the treatment instead. And so this is clinically significant macular edema. And here's another polling question. Hold on, it's coming. Definition of CSME is all the following except thickening within a third, thickening of one disc diameter larger within one DD, retinal thickening with hemorrhage, a half disc diameter from the fovea, hard exudates within one third disc diameter of the fovea with adjacent retinal thickening. Something we always we all had to learn for boards. And there it is. Do you, do you have to click the little donut? Okay. Well, that was fun. So all is following except. That's an important one, except. Okay, they're rolling in. Got a little bit more, a little bit more to come. I want to make sure this is uh, interactive and meets COPE requirements so they're being a credit. Mm 
It's a tough one. I think this is question number 42 of the boards. Next time, all true, false, Joe. All true. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're, for the sake of time, we're going to end the poll here. We got a good response. I'm going to share the results. Okay. So that's very good. Everybody did well. So the one thing is that there, it had, doesn't have anything to do with hemorrhage, right? It's thickening, thickening, thickening. So thickening out of within the center of the fovea, exudate in the center of the fovea if there's thickening. If you have exudate and there's no thickening, then it's not CSME or an area of thickening that's just gigantic because the fovea has a peristalsis. It'll pull the thickening down into the fovela and then ruin vision under those circumstances. So this is the best slide that I could provide for you that would show you a monocular representation of thickening. Maybe you can appreciate that this glop of exudate is in front of this glop, that it's thickened. Joe was present for the most famous answer ever given by the retinologist. Joe and I were present during our residency and I asked the, the, the retinal specialist uh, at the time, I said, and I won't give him my name, but I said, Dr. So-and-so, how do you see that it's thick? To me, it all looks the same. And he, he turned to me and he said, thickening, thickening. Oh, oh, thank you. Did you get that, Joe? Thickening, thickening. Yes, thickening is thickening. Thank you. It, it, was, it was the wisdom of Solomon. Thank you. Thick, what was I thinking? I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I was thinking thickening was thinning. It's thickening. And so here's what happened when you put down the grid. Oh, by the way, Andy, I, I think the, the exact phrase uh, when we were there was thickness thickening, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> the the, the retina specialist you must admit, Joe, was always nice. He, yes. was, he, was, he, was never, he was never like that. There were people that were like that, but not the retina specialist. <laughs> so he might have been thinking that, but he was always nice. And so here you can see all of that fluid dries up. Now, remember what I told you, this may be a hundred micrometer burn, but it does extend pretty large. Now you're not using enough power to get a, uh, a chorioretinal scar. That's why you really don't see through this with chorioretinal atrophy. What you're trying to do is get those small microaneurysms to shrivel and occlude so they don't leak anymore. You're not trying to get choroidal oxygen here. You don't wanna create that much damage where the papillomacular bundle and fovela are. But here you can see it's worked quite nicely. Here's an area of thickening. That's a disc area in size or greater within a disc area of the center of the fovela. The same thing is true here, but it's right in the fovea and look at all that fluid. And so what's gotten easier for all of us, remember, I'm an old head and Joe's an old head and Mars is an old head. We had to look at this with a ruby lens. We, had, we didn't have a 90 or a 60 until just about our residency time, the, 60 di, the 90 diopter lens and then the 60 came out. We didn't have this highfalutin uh, piece of equipment that does an MRI of your retina and gives you an interpretation that says it's edema dummy. And, and so, uh, but this is the way you would do it now. And you can see how pulled apart it is and how cystic that is. What is remarkable is if you get that fluid to go away, the tissue recompacts and you actually get your vision back. That's what's remarkable about vascular endothelial growth factor. That's the news flash, but I know you all know that. The studies that have been shown, read, rise, resolve, restore, all demonstrate that when you treat these cases with vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor, not only does your vision, a visual acuity loss arrest, you actually get vision back. And so that's what's remarkable about it. And so I'm just showing you some cases. And so here again, everything's okay. Clinically significant macular edema. The uh, arterial venous phase of the fluorescein angiogram with areas of hyperfluorescent dots that increase in size and intensity over the course of the angiogram. And so you would aim the laser in this area with a grid. And here what happens, you can see no chorioretinal scars and the fluid dries up. 
Now, back in these days, clinically significant macular edema is the way we went. Today, we don't use that term. In the year 2021, because we have the, um, what's this thing called? OCT. OCT, the optical coherence tomography thing, and we can see the cystic edema when we use a five line or 21 line raster test, and you can scroll up and down through that, that there's diabetic macular edema. To, we call this today diabetic macular edema. In, in other words, what I'm saying is, is it doesn't have to meet the strict criteria of CSME. If you do a 21 or five line raster, whatever you decide to do, and you find cysts in here, send it. And so, in summary, the early treatment of diabetic retinopathy study, 3,000 patients. The study was truncated over 10 years. The study ran from 1979 to 1989, had 30 some reports, by the way. Commented that aspirin didn't hurt you, but it didn't really help you. It commented the time to do folk of scatter photocoagulation or PRP was only when you see the retinopathy. It commented what clinically significant macular edema was, and it concluded beyond the shadow of a doubt that focal laser or grid laser helped arrest acuity loss. And so what's different today is that now we have diabetic macular edema and diabetic macular edema doesn't have to meet that stringent criteria because we can so much more easily find it. And so most retinologists today, rather than do caustic laser photocoagulation, they'd rather do the injection, dry up the fluid, and then come in with laser later to see if they can, can, can then clean up whatever is still leaking. And that's what this chart says. Here are all the studies that demonstrate that vascular endothelial growth factor use for diabetic patients is wonderful. And here you can see, they all begin with R, restore, resolve, rise, ride, um, uh, reveal, read. So you can see them all there. And, and this is what they showed. Here is the easiest one to see. In this Bolt study, you can see when they did laser over 24 months, visual acuity got worse. But when they treated with bevacizumab, a flibercept, you recovered acuity. And that's what you see in all of these. So let's look at restore. Laser are triangle, black triangles that are empty. Your visual acuity sort of stays a, the same. But the triangles that are all covered in are all up here. Let's look at the green ones. In the Da Vinci study, laser is the laser is the circles that are hollow. It certainly looks like you you lose visual acuity over time. But look at the colored in circles. You you gain ten letters. And so here, you know, you can say to the patient, "There's a good possibility we'll be able to make things better." Now, uh, here is another poll question. Okay, oh, I didn't. I didn't mention any of these. Let me just mention. Let me just mention what they are, and that way you'll get a hundred on the question. And so the the common vascular endothelial growth factors are macugen, pegaptanib, uh, avastin, which is bevacizumab, and pegaptan, uh, and uh, a flibercept, which is bevacizumab. They're the common ones. There is a uh, ranimizumab is a uh, macugen. Macugen. Ranimizumab is help me. Lucentis. 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 Lu Lucentis. Oh my god. Okay, but I'm not embarrassed. I'm just old, and so uh, I have trouble with my name sometimes. It, it, uh, it's like it's like eavesdropping in a high school language class. <laughs> so all right. So now we can now we can do this. So, oh geez, I don't want to say anything now. No, no, I, I'm, I'm at the end. I'm at the end. I can cover it fast.
doesn't explode. All right, we got a good response. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Yay! Everybody. Yay! So Jetria is the injectable that helps you when you have a PVD, uh, acroplasmin that breaks the chemical bonds between the vitreous and the neurosensory retina. Ilea is a flibercept, Avastin, Bevacizumab, and Lucentis is a pegaptanid. Or, ma or any, uh, mac macugen, macugen. So what this shows you is that when you treat with vascular endothelial growth factor, when it's a sham, when, when actually there's no drug, you're much more likely to get PDR than if you treat with the real drug. What this shows is if you treat with vascular endothelial growth factor, whatever it will be, and here they're using a flibercept. But the idea is the sham, there's no drug in there, much more a chance of you getting diabetic macular edema than if you actually have the drug. And lastly, but not leastly, whether you get proliferative diabetic retinopathy, anterior segment neovascularization, or diabetic retinopathy, if you treat with a sham, it's not the real drug, you're way more likely to get this stuff than if you actually have the drug. This, this graph says the drugs work. So this is what the stuff looks like. I just want to let you know that you can see Lucentis, which is Rani Mizubab. Uh, you can see here that it's $2,000 for a little vial. And Avastin, which is virtually the same stuff, is like 50 bucks for a vial. The reason is, is Avastin is an old drug. We had it since, I don't know, the 50s, maybe 60s, 70s. It was for treating cancer. That, that particular molecule is 270 kilodaltons. The Lucentis molecule, the new one that they made, is actually um, uh, 70 kilodaltons. They didn't think that this particular molecule would get to the retina, and they never bothered to check. Turns out they both work. I'll give you the name of the trial that proves that, the CATT, the CAT trial, the comparison an age-related macular degeneration treatment trial demonstrated that these two drugs can be used. Uh, if one fails, the other can be attempted. And so here's the injection. And this is now frequently being used with micropulse laser by progressive retinologists. Micropulse laser delivers much smaller spots using the technique of start and stop technology. What they discovered was each one of those beats adds up to help and each one of the spaces stops retinal injury. The problem with micropulse is you can't see where you put it and it takes twice as long to get an effect. Why am I telling you this? Because vascular endothelial growth factor use is not free. One, it's not permanent. Vascular endothelial growth factor is part of a technique of treatment called treat and extend. And so you absolutely have to go back and keep getting these needles. And so that, that's not, that's not uh, fun. Secondly, when you get that stuff put in your eye, your vision initially goes down. And that's why we saw that when we, when we looked at those graphs. And so you're actually looking through all that stuff till it clears and has its effect. You can actually hit a blood vessel when you put it in and cause a vitreous hemorrhage. It's possible for you to knock the retina off and give a retinal detachment. It's possible for the, the technique to create infection and you get end off the mitre. And so lastly, but not leastly, it's also possible that you get a, a, an RPE detachment. RPE detachment is a failing of BGFI use. However, it's rare. I want to wind up by telling you these important points. One, macular edema that's treatable in diabetes is never visual acuity dependent. What that means is that you can have perfect visual acuity and still need the treatment. Two, you still need fluorescein angiography to determine if there's macular edema and where to aim the grid or focal laser. Three, if you ever have a case where you have CSME and high-risk characteristics at the same time, 
always treat the CSME first. If you do scatter photocoagulation before you treat the CSME, it'll get worse. And once the vision goes bad, there's no guarantee we'll get it back. Always monitor pregnant people very closely. And so people who are not diabetic and then get pregnant are at risk of diabetes and at risk for retinopathy. People who had retinopathy and then get pregnant are at great risk that it could get worse. Monitor them closely. Lastly, and most importantly, just because they have diabetes doesn't mean it's diabetic retinopathy. This is a vein occlusion. It would be in one eye. The other eye would be perfectly clear. Think if it's not in both eyes, then is that diabetes? Why would diabetes just affect one eye? This is in the periphery, and this is uh, ocular ischemic syndrome with mid-peripheral hemorrhages. Again, probably in only one eye from carotid occlusive disease. And this has got a Roth spot right here and a cotton wool spot, but not a lot of exudate and not a lot of retinopathy around. This is probably hypertensive or coagulopathic retinopathy. And so you wanna make sure that you run the whole gamut of tests to make sure you don't miss something that hasn't been diagnosed. What's the future hold? Maybe that you wind up with a whole bunch of more new and more useful VEGFI molecules. Maybe they modify the laser or the lasing material. Maybe it's laser, micropulse or traditional, plus the VEGFI inhibitors, and maybe laser and steroids. And here are the common steroids. This is Kenalog. This is Alluvian and Redisert. This is Flucinolone. This is Ozerdix. Dex, and this is anacortave acetate. These steroids can be put in the eye also to help you. I want to say I'm honored that you would come and listen to me. Mark feels the same way. The uh, introduction that Joe gave was very touching. I, I took that to heart and I feel that he is my family and we're honored that we got a chance to come to you on a Sunday night and give you education. Hopefully it was helpful and entertaining. Thank you. Mark, any final words? No, I think Andy summarized it quite well. Thanks. And thanks for having us and hope everyone has a great holiday season. Mark, if you'll just uh, un stop sharing your screen, I'll take over. Hey, Joe, I just want to say to Mark and Andy, thank you for doing this. I was listening all along. I couldn't be there live, but uh, thanks for doing it, guys. <laughs> thank you, Greg. All right. Very good. We're going to wrap up. Thank you very, very much. Ocular manifestations of diabetes. You know, I, I, really, I really hope or wish that other professionals, ophthalmologists, retinal specialists, family fact practitioners, internists, um, endocrinologists would listen to that tape and, and, and the knowledge that you have. And then they could start to really begin to realize that we're not just a bunch of gals and guys, uh, you know, better one or two. I, I, I think that really, really, uh, really is very impressive. Your knowledge and your, your ability to uh, communi communicate that. So thank you so much, guys. Next, we're going to have Managing Glaucoma with OCT Imaging. That'll be Tuesday night with Dr. Michael Shiglazen. He was a huge hit when he was here a few weeks ago. That's why we had to br bring him back. We have some upcoming webinars, pediatric eye exam for the primary care optometrist, Dr. Nidhi Rana from Will's Eye Institute. We've been a lot of requests for pediatrics. What's wrong with that cornea? Dr. Katie Grenier, uh, she will talk about that in scleral lenses. A really great opportunity is ocular oncology, whatever every optometrist needs to know by one of the foremost ocular oncologists in the country, Dr. Tim Murray. Dr. Nanita Brown, a glaucoma surgeon, will talk about a life without blebs. I've seen the presentation. It looks very interesting. Uh, Dr. Chris Putnam, who is serving, over, serving our country overseas, will be here for a clinical potpourri, off-label medicines with clinical optometric education or implications. We had him at our, our Scottsdale meeting last year, and he was just phenomenal. And we're going to wrap up glaucoma clinical case conversations with Greg, myself, and Mark Dunbar. We're going to just uh, three guys talking glaucoma cases. So we're looking forward to uh, to that. Don't forget Sunday the twelfth, and we're going we're going to be we're going to have uh, we're going to have morning and afternoon, or morning morning and evening. The nineteenth, we're going to have morning and evening as well. So we're going to have eleven o'clock and a seven o'clock on the Sundays. 
Our upcoming live events, our midwinter getaway is going to be at Scottsdale, a new venue, the Western Kierlin. It's a phenomenal uh, place. We're going to go to Strasbourg, France, uh, with our partner Rosenberg School of Optometry for 16 hours, with plenty of time to, uh, to, to view the city and the area. In June, we're coming back to Orlando, the Orlando World Center Marriott for our Sunshine State Summer Conference. In August, we're gonna be going to Mackinac Island. Now this year we sold out, we ran out of room, so book early, we can't guarantee spots. And toward the end of the year, we're gonna be at Music City Fall Classic in Nashville, Tennessee. And pending travel and availability and border, border security, we'd like to go back to Quebec City if not 2022, maybe 2023. Stay tuned for that. Uh, we've always gone through this. You're gonna, you're gonna be getting your, your survey in just a few minutes. Please fill that out. It's very important for us to, uh, to maintain COPE, uh, COPE credentialing. So with that, Greg, if you're there, if, you wanna, if there's anything you wanna say, Nope. I just want to say thanks for everyone attending. Joe, thanks for doing this for me tonight. Thank you. No worries. Everybody have a good night.